My name's Ken King. I'm a coach, a learning and performance consultant, and the founder and owner of the Boost Institute. This is Real Learning with Real People. These conversations are with real people. They're unscripted and they're designed to pull tidbits of information from people who are grinding right now to get the most out of their lives. With minimum amounts of editing and maximum authenticity, we strive to provide lessons that anybody will find effective, relatable, and entertaining. We seek to have guests that provide learning based on their life experiences. Some are chosen because of their experiences as high performers in sport, business, or education, whereas others have been chosen because they have meaningful lessons to teach, and I want to make sure they have the platform to share with the world. The language in the videos can sometimes be mature, as I'm always encouraging my guests to just be themselves. This is all part of making sure that we do our best to give you content that is both authentic and effective, and that you feel like you can utilize the real learning in order to connect with these real people. Today's guest is Canada Basketball's Women's High Performance Manager, Mike McKay. Mike started his professional career as a physical education teacher, but now has managed to touch almost every corner of the globe as he chases high performance in the field. For women's high performance basketball in Canada, he's developed the gold medal profile, he's a technical lead, he's in charge of coaching development, and he oversees the Next Gen program. Mike has experience coaching track and field and football in addition to basketball, and his insights will help anyone in coaching or leadership. Personally, I look up to Mike as a mentor and a coach, and I'm excited to share this conversation that has a lot of great coaching nuggets and also tell some great stories of how Mike came to be the great coaching mind he is. Here's our chat with Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you? Very good. Yourself, Ken? I'm really good. It's finally a bit of a warm day here in Calgary, so... We're having the same sun out there today. Yeah. Well, and, and I need I need to find a better intro, and I've talked about this multiple times on here. I do the not-so-authentic hello, which drives me kind of nuts, <laughs> and then I talk about the weather, and I don't I, I, I need to sit down and really dig deep on, on how to enter into the show a little bit better than that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah. It's, it's the safe option, right? Yes. It's better, it's better than me standing and, and dancing my way into the frame or singing, the, singing my own theme song or something. So I prefer the weather question. <laughs> um, if, if we jump right in here, you, you have a really interesting story that I, I know some of, but I, 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 know, I also know I don't know all of it. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your background before we dive into your views on learning today. I'd love to hear a bit about your background, how you grew up, what your family situation was like, where you grew up, and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, I think I was very fortunate to have the family that I did have. I mean, my, my, my mother and father probably had the most influence on me than anybody. Uh, the next would be my, my high school coaches and my university coaches. So I was very, very fortunate to have good role models and uh, teach me my values and my uh, principles. But my mother, I always says, you know, she was a, she was a former teacher, but She's probably the most competitive person I know because we used to play little card games and and little monopolies and stuff, and she would not let you win. Like, you had to win, and if you – I didn't handle winning well, she would make me know that. And uh, and then my father probably was just the work ethic. Uh, you know, he was his own – ran his own business, but he was also caring. You know, like both of my, my parents were very caring people and, uh, you know, help others and uh, give back, and so – I learned that from them very, very much. But when I got into high school, or actually was in junior high, uh, I had a very um, a phys ed teacher who really was my first coach, like in coach, coached me in soccer, coached me in basketball, coached me in hockey. But he, he had a big influence. And I said, I'd really like to get a job like that. And at that time, when you went into the high school, you had to get recommended to take phys ed because there was a limited number of people. So... I was fortunate he gave me a recommendation to take phys ed. So I always remembered that and, and uh, thanked him for that. But when I got to high school, I just happened to have some really good coaches. My football coach was in the Nova Scotia Hall of Fame, and my basketball coach was in the Nova Scotia Hall of Fame. So these were very influential people. Who was that? Uh, Keith McKenzie was my football coach. Um, you know, he, he was also the person who got me into coaching women's basketball because he coached football and women's basketball. So when I was at Acadia University, I was very fortunate there. I had, uh, I didn't play. I was the manager because I, I had some injuries with my shoulders, so I couldn't really play. But 
both the football coach at Acadia and the basketball coach got me involved as managers because they knew I wanted to coach. And our, my football coach was John Hewitt, and he had played in the NFL, and then he ended up eventually coaching with the Argos. Um, he was the first what I would call professional coach that I really worked with who, who really treated it as a professional. Um, he taught me some amazing things. Um, one, the biggest thing he taught me was how to break down film. And back then it was actually film. Uh, we used to play the games on Saturday. I would take the film to Nowlands Canteen in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, put it on the bus to Montreal because that's where it got developed. And then Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, I'd be back down at Nowlands Canteen waiting for the bus to come in from Halifax. I would take the tape over, and Coach had taught me at that time, you took the tape and you would put it in this pro- – it wasn't a projector. It was basically a little TV screen with a light in it, and you would clip out the offensive – so you'd snip it, and you put make it to an offensive reel, a defensive reel, and a kicking reel, and you just scotch tape them together. And then I would take the offensive reel, and he taught me to take the offensive line and grade them on every single play. So I had the play, and this is before computer. So I had a big sheet of paper that would have the down and distance, position on the field, uh, what the play was, and then I had five circles with the right and left foot of all the offensive linemen. And I would go through every play and grade, did they step with the proper foot? And I'd put a red mark or a green mark, depending if they stepped with the proper foot, because that was what he was very big on. So then at the end, if let's say they ran 100 plays, if you had 50 right, you got a 50. I grade every offensive lineman on his footwork for that last game. That, that was huge. That, was, that really taught me to learn how to pay attention to detail. And when I started coaching high school, I started doing the same thing. But then when people were telling me, like, why would you be doing that in basketball? No one does that. I said, well, it worked in football. Why wouldn't I do it for basketball? And I tell you, it really helped me pay attention to footwork for my athletes. And, but it was also just teaching me that if you want to know something, track it and just see what's actually happening. My basketball coach had actually coached with the Houston Rockets. And that's another interesting okay. story. During the 76 Olympics, they had a competition across the country to become minor officials. And he won for Nova Scotia as the backup officials. And they had the final tournament before the Olympics in in Hamilton. And they got selected at the backup minor officials. But that still got him tickets to the Montreal Olympics. And when he was in the Montreal Olympics, he was sitting in the stands. And he was sitting beside this gentleman. They got talking basketball. Well, ended up his name was uh, Tom Masaki, who was the head coach of the Houston Rockets. Well, later that night, he went out just walking around the streets of Montreal, went in this restaurant. Well, who was there but Tom Nasaki again? And I was like, hey, best buddies. And, and you have to know my coach was Ian McMillan. He was just the type that, you know, Tom Nasaki made the you know, casual remark, well, if you're ever in Houston, let, let me know. Well, Ian took a sabbatical from teaching high school, went down to Houston and said, here I am. I'm here for the year. And uh, was basically the advanced scout for the Houston Rockets for a year. And so when he came back to Acadian, this would be – 78 70 sorry 79 or so he i mean he he had been coaching with a you know 24 second shot clock nba player so he was so far ahead of the game on offense so our our 1981 acadia basketball team we averaged over 100 points a game with no three-point line and no you know 24 second shot clock i mean we we didn't play a whole lot of defense but i'm telling you we could play offense but i learned so much offense so basketball from him because he was just like you say he was an nba coach Yep. where everybody else was still coaching, you know, university. So I was very fortunate to have such powerful role models in high school and in, and in university as to be in coaching. But I was also fortunate that I had a, a professor, Gary Ness, and he was one of the original NCCP people. So I think his NCCP numbers like kind of like in double digits, you know, like I, I actually yep. knew some people who had double digit NCCP numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, mine's in the 2000s, so it was pretty new. But he, he made sure in my first year university that we, we got involved in NCCP. And from that, it gave me a foundation um, to structure. I don't say the NCCP made me a master coach, but it definitely gave me a foundation. And I got involved, and then there was a lady named Carolyn Savoy who was the head coach at Dow. And early on in my career, Carolyn came to me and said, Mike, Two things are going to happen. One, you're going to coach provincial basketball. And two, you're going to become a course conductor for NCCP. 
Well, if Carolyn said that to you, you had no choice, but that's what you were going to do. And I, it was Carolyn, and this would be 1985. So I was only 25 years old, but Carolyn saw something in me, and she said, no, this is what you're going to do. And through coaching provincial basketball and eventually becoming the master course conductor in the NCCP and always constantly trying to learn and grow, that really set me on a pathway to where I am today. It was, it was basically through that. But I always had that passion, and that came right from the, you know, uh, my my junior high and high school experiences with my coaches, right? Playing lots of different sports, right? That ma- that makes a lot of sense. I, I think for the people that watch this who have been involved in sports their whole life, we all understand what sports is and does, and and that that could be a conversation that that we could go into pretty far. I'd like to come back to a couple of things that, that, that you mentioned there. That, um, going all the way back, you talked about mom and dad. Are you an only child? No, four boys. Four boys. Four, four boys. more or, or you're three, one of four? Three, three, one of four. I'm the second oldest. My oldest brother, re- he's involved in computer science, so he was never really into sports. Mm-hmm. But I was the guy who would organize what we were going to do that day for the whole neighborhood. So, and it was usually around sports being active and we're competing so we're going to play baseball today it's okay so everybody go round up all the guys play baseball or we're going to play hockey today we're going to play whatever and i'd be the one who was inventing games like i love to invent games just to be active um so you know I, we're lucky where i i first lived in nova scotia there's a bunch of boys my age and then when i got to Toronto, when we moved to Toronto, when i was in grade six again there were a bunch of boys our age and we were able to get end up competing but it was interesting, like hockey, when I moved to Truro and I went to try it for the hockey team, the gentleman said, I still remember him, said, if you played last year, go to this end of the ice. If you didn't play, the, go to this end of the ice. Well, I just moved, so I didn't play last year. I went to the other end of the ice. Well, what it became was that the one end where you had played, that was a try for the June or the PWAs and the end I went was the PWBs. Well, there was me and another fellow that was uh, his family lived in Camp de Bert in the military. He had never played. Well, in the first game we played, he scored something like nine goals, and I scored four <laughs> goals. We were two of the best players in the in the Peewees, but we weren't, we weren't on the Peewees. And then I didn't know until later on, but the coach of the Peewees came down after the first game and said, well, we want these two guys to come up to PWA. And our coach said, no, you put them down with me. They're staying with me. But we dominated <laughs> But that also, you know, led to why I probably got more involved with basketball and other sports than hockey, because hockey was more about who you knew. And, um, you know, and I'll actually admit, when I got up to midget, I went to the tryout for the midget team and the coach was drunk, whereas, you know, my basketball coach was in the Hall of Fame. Well, you know, from my family background, there was no way I was going to go play for a drunk coach. That was not right. going to happen. Right. So, uh, you know, but I loved hockey. Hockey, yeah. you know, Canadian boy growing up, that's what you played. Yeah, that that's really interesting I, too. I think that the that speaks to, like you said, the family, the family that you came from. It just became a non-starter, right? It, it's just if that's if that's the well, situation the coach is in at that at that time, then then the decision starts to get a little bit easier. I think that speaks a lot to family values and, and well, just the moral values that that like there was no drinking in my family. It's just just it wasn't a just wasn't a, I was I was never around alcohol. Just never around until I got to uh, really till late junior high and high school. And then I saw just guys being stupid. And I said, well, why would I want to act like that? You know, there's right. no social drinking that just didn't exist. Yeah. So when I saw on sports teams, when I saw that kind of behavior, it was like, no, that's not that's not what sports is about. And that was one of the issues when I was, you know, coaching it. And that's what I loved about Coach Hewitt at Acadia. When I went to Acadia my first year. The coach there was the big thing was um, what are they called initiations. You know, all the rookie athletes were initiated. Well, there was a bunch of us from my high school. None of us tried out, and one of the reasons was because we didn't want to be involved in that initiation because the reputation of the initiation had got was preceding the actual football. So right. there was a bunch of us never tried out. It wasn't until Coach Yurt came in the next year, and he just basically said, "Everybody's a rookie. There's no such thing as initiation." Well, one of the guys that was from my school, he actually became a I think he eventually became an all Canadian. He was like a, a center, he, but he wouldn't play when there was that initiation stuff was going on. That again was the yeah. values. And, you know, so I think that stuff is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
if you if you had to if kind of building on that, I guess is interesting to me. If you had to describe your mom with a word, what would you what would you use? Uh, caring. What about dad? But 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 I want to make sure I understand. That's not yeah. she cared, but she challenged you by caring for you, right? She knew what was best. Like if my mom said to me something like, "I'm I'm really disappointed in you." Like there's no worse thing she could have said than I'm disappointed in you. And, yeah. You know, and uh, you know that's just. You just never wanted to because she just knew how much she cared for you and how much she did for you and how much she did for others too. It wasn't just me, but like when she passed away, we couldn't believe the number of people that said that, that she had helped over the years that no one ever knew about. It was the same with my father. Yeah. Um, for my father, oh. uh, that's, that's a tricky one because I would say it's one was his humor. Okay. He, he, he had a way of connecting with people through his humor and he wasn't like a, a joke teller, but he just made people comfortable and he showed people that he cared. But on the same token, it was his, his work ethic. I mean, you just, I can still remember one time coming home from a basketball practice and I was, or it was a football practice and, and I made the mistake of complaining about how hard it was. And so my father, this would be like on the Friday. So my father said, well, I tell you what, tomorrow you can come work with me on Saturday. Well, <laughs> there's no way I was going to go work with him because that meant you're going to be up at seven and you were going to work till seven that night. And it meant you had like maybe five minutes to eat a lunch and you were working. I said, no, I'll be okay. I, I never complained <laughs> again about how hard it was playing sports. You know, never. Yeah. And well, uh, when uh, when when you say it's interesting that you're pulling and and I don't think it's a coincidence that as I continue to interview and talk to high performers on this that there's threads that are being very very common mm. from from person to person and and one of the things that I spoke about with her name is Dr. Kendra Coates and she she's a doctor of education um, out in Oregon and we talked a lot about humor as a teaching tool and how, oh, yeah. and how there's, there's really, there's two sides to that because, and I, I know I've experienced both in the sense that when I use humor as a young teacher or coach, I've had to learn and I'm still learning very much how to make sure that the humor is, is in the realm of connection yes. and, and learning and doesn't, I know my I know my humor doesn't cross into ever being unprofessional, but doesn't get perceived more importantly yes. as being unprofessional. But we we talked a lot about how it, we really are at this time where there there's a lot of instructors, whether they're whether they're teachers, coaches slash teachers, as those two t terms should be used pretty interchangeably, um, or or even just people in business and stuff like that, and how humor is really a powerful connection tool for a lot of people. And what you just did is you turned that kind of into into something that's almost a double edged sword, where it's like humor and hard work as being something that really drive you forward. Oh well, and it's you know I'll I'll tell the other story that me and my father joke about now, or when he was still living, we used to joke about it was I was a diesel. He was a diesel mechanic, so. I would, that was my first career choice was being a diesel mechanic. So I worked with him a, quite a bit in the summer times, but it was hard work. But I was working on a, a brake job on a truck and five o'clock came. And back then you used to have a, a time clock and you'd punch your card. So I punched out my card and I was getting ready to leave, but I was going to bike home, get a bite to eat. And I had a baseball or was a, I play pretty high level soft, uh, softball back then. Right. And, and my father said, well, where are you going? I said, well, I got a ball game tonight i gotta get home get some supper before we get to the ball field he says okay okay we had enough of this like when are you going to stop playing games and settle down and get a job so i always joke said i don't know what my mother said to him that night that allowed me to stay home but <laughs> <laughs> jokingly after they had always said that well we're gonna let the boys decide what they want to do and that was when for him it was tough because i was his best mechanic and he could see me i was a good mechanic and he thought you know, he's going to take over the business. He'll be a good mechanic. He's smart. 
but I didn't want to be a mechanic. I wanted to play sports. So he would joke that I never did ever get a job. I was just playing games my whole life. Now, he was very proud of what I had done, but yeah, yeah, he always yeah. joked about that I never really did have a job. But I learned that, you know, like I was going to be committed to something. I got to be committed like he was. I knew I couldn't do both. So I committed to getting sport, playing in sports right, and making a living through that. So here's, this just popped in my head while you were talking about that. What are the difference, if there is any, other than the obvious, between being a mechanic and being a coach? Oh, there's no difference. Like, that's what I loved. <laughs> yeah. about, that's what I loved about being a mechanic was you had to figure out the problem. You had to be able to, to take the, the vehicle. And that's what my father was so good at. That's like, there were people come from all over the Maritimes to get him and analyze their truck. Because you didn't want somebody just going in and ripping things apart. You want to be able to go right to the heart of the problem. And he was just very good at listening to it. And he'd always tell me, yeah, you got to listen to it. You know, should know what it sounds like. And, but that's what coaching is, right? You're able to look at something and you know how it's supposed to work. But then you, what's not making it work right? Then you got to figure out how to fix it. And then you got to test drive it and test it. And then you learn from your mistakes. And I learned that from him. You know, like I learned how to, but you learned how to do things right too. You didn't just take a hammer and a cold chisel you had to use the right equipment and you know and uh, if you didn't know you asked though i i i learned so much from him about how to how to analyze things and to work about things and we talk about that stuff all the time later on when he's uh, he was you know getting around and couldn't move we just sit there and talk and compare how what i did in teaching and coaching and what he did as a mechanic you know we talk about that stuff all the time and, and as he got working with people how you had to work with people how you had to you know because it was still a people business too Totally. I've, I'm, and I've used that analogy a little bit in the past. Uh, and I didn't really think about it again until until you brought it up. But I've, I've said the that that sometimes we're like mechanics as coaches, just because of the fact that we can also fix a problem the wrong way. Oh, yes. In the sense that like you can you can put a piece and I've done this in, in my car, you can put a piece of black tape over the check engine light. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the underlying issue has gone away. And I, I think that there's probably a little bit of like uh, emergency room doctor chucked in there too, in the sense that sometimes you have to triage the things that you're looking to problem solve. But well, you, you got in the middle of the game, sometimes you just got to get to the end of the game. Right. And I would yeah. say that's where you use the duct tape or you, you know, and my father would tell about that, you know, you, all the things you could do with a coat hanger as a mechanic. Yeah. Like yeah. just to just to get that exhaust hung up till you get back to, and that's in a game. I'd I'd say the same thing. Sometimes you're just doing that emergency fix, but now I got to go back and fix it for the long term, right? right. Or else that problem's going to keep cropping up. If I don't go and do something inside the duct tape, eventually it's going to fall apart, and then I can't fix it. You know. So I think there are a lot of analogies like that are very very powerful. Yeah, and as we as we talk problem solving, now that you're working with so many. Um, so many, so many coaches and, and coaches from a variety of levels, uh, you, you, like you, you truly get to experience in what you're doing now, the entire continuum of coaching. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And is there, a, is there a common, uh, weakness or maybe a common strength or, or a common theme, I guess I should say, in terms of problem solving in some of the best coaches so i'm not I'm, I'm using the term best in the obviously respecting that just because somebody's at a low level doesn't mean that they can't be in your best no. category just because somebody's an olympic coach doesn't mean that they're definitely in the best category the best coaches that you've worked with is there a common theme in terms of problem solving that they have i th i think the best coaches have a bigger toolbox or they have more experiences the biggest issue i see with a lot of coaches is they only have plan A, right? They only have one option. And when that option doesn't work, it's like, well, I guess I can't, I can't do anything. They haven't thought about enough options. And when I try, I mean, this comes right from the NCCP, make ethical decisions. And that's why I've always liked that because it's the first step after it's legal or ethical is, you know, what are your options? But the biggest thing teaching that course is coaches will have two options. It's play or don't play. But there's 15, 16, 18, 20 in between, and they can't think of those ones. They only think of it's play or don't play, right? It's black or it's white. It's up or it's down. But it's, it's the ones in the edges on the edges or the ones in between or ones way out there. So 
getting sometimes to really be able to think way out there on the extreme, like this is so far out there, no one ever would do it. But then there's the one way over there. Well, reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And just getting people to a point where they can actually talk about those, because I'll throw out some ideas to coaches sometimes. They're like, that'll never work. I said, well, how do you know? I said, right. and it may not work, but can we at least start thinking towards that direction? Oh, I never thought of that. You know? And that's where I think experience comes in is as long as, as I always say, there's two types of coaches that two coaches have coached 10 years. Well, one coach has done the same thing for 10 years. So that coach has one year of experience repeated 10 times. Well, I always like to say, are you the coach who's had actually 10 years of experience where you've actually done different things, reflected on them, changed, grown, right? D done different things. And it's that coach who's re who's, has 10 years of experience of changing and growing is the one I want to work with. Yeah, that's, I, I like, I like that one year repeated 10 times. I, I think that that that's one of those concepts that is definitely a coaching concept mm -hmm. that, and it comes from coaching, but it's, it's one of those things that I like to pull on when we talk about performance, regardless of the arena that you're trying to perform in, in the sense that, there, there is definitely experience and then there's repeated experience for the positive or the negative. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give an example from teaching. My, my first, one of my first teaching jobs was as a substitute teacher for a biology teacher. And it was probably the easiest teaching I ever had because he had just had a, this is what you do in day one. This is what you do period two, you know, period three, period three. It was all mapped out. And basically, it was the same lesson plan he had for over 20 years of teaching. And you could see where he just put in the new calendar and the new day. But, but to me, I could never do that. Yeah. It worked for him. And listen, he was a great teacher. I love the man. He, he would help me, help me a lot. But I, I, when I taught, every time I taught something, I'd say, oh, I could have done that better. And I used to love it when I would have, like, say, three courses, and then you get to repeat it the next time because I knew I could get better the next time right? Like, you know, you're teaching three sections of something. I get better the next time I taught it because I could learn from that. Yeah. Whereas there, I saw a lot of teachers just go in, present it, boom. Next year, I'll do the exact same thing, the exact same way. I could never do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been critiqued for changing my course outline too much in the past because because every year i'm like oh i want to add this in or i want to take this out and, yeah. and that kind of thing and, and it does seem like there's a lot of moments where both students and and people on, on the on the teaching side and administration side the consistency is something that people are comfortable with and they like and we're all kind of wired to like that 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 consistency but i find especially in 2020 and and beyond it's like every every couple minutes there's there's something new that i could add into something like yeah. we're gonna we're gonna get off this call and i'm gonna learn something new about recording these calls and i'm gonna want to yeah. do it next time yeah i mean there like i know when i'm doing mentorship within the nccp i'm training say the new learning facilitators they'll always tell me that well mike you got to stick to the curriculum you can't be putting in the new stuff yeah. and i say well then i'm the worst one to be training the new person because i i react to the audience or i react to the people i'm teaching and I, I'm, I get very good at, at sensing what their needs are. Yep. And if the old curriculum is not fitting that, I'm not going to go down that path. I'm going to go with a technique or, or present it in a way that I can be in touch with them. Um, that's just the way I'm wired is to be in tune to my, my audience or to my learners. Yeah, I think now you're really building a, a theme of, of adaptability. When you talk about yeah. problem solving, you talk about the ability to bounce around in, in games and maybe duct tape it and try and find a better solution after the game. That that adaptability is really important. And something tells me that we can probably trace even, even that quality back to having a mechanic involved in your life at, so early. Like I feel like that's a, that's a similar thing. Well, I would say it's more than a mechanic. It's also, I didn't realize at the time, but we weren't really that, I'm going to say, well off. Like, we didn't have a whole lot, but I'll tell you, we could make do with a lot of things. Like, I had this old toy can that happened to be round. It came from, a, you know, my father got it from Mack Trucks, and it was just a, a round cardboard cylinder. But, man, dear, that became my basketball hoop, right? Um, you know, the games, I remember as a boy playing, 
There used to be a drink you'd get at, at school called Beep. It was an apricot drink that you got. And we would take it in the wintertime, and we would take the Beep containers and put water in them and leave them outside, and they'd freeze, and those became our pucks. And then we'd go break off a couple alder bushes, and we'd be outside. There's a little piece of down on the baseball field used to freeze over, and we'd, we weren't allowed skates, but we'd be out there playing hockey. He just made up games. Yeah. You know, one time we had somebody brought a gourd. I don't know why they brought a gourd. To school. Well, that became our football. We were playing up in the field, and then the teachers came up, and because we were getting all muddy, and they they were all mad at us. But man, if there was time to play, we were making up games. Yeah. You know, you, like with baseball, that's what I love about baseball. You could play one on one on all. You could bat. I used to bat rocks with my bat, and then you'd throw the ball up on the roof and catch it. You could throw it against the wall, and two people you could play three. Like you just invented games, yeah. and that was again adapting. You know, and I find a lot now, like if you don't have all five, 10 or 12 players at practice, well, I don't know what to do. Oh my yeah. goodness. Like we can do a lot of things. We can adapt. We can, let's make it work. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I gotta be honest. Someone tells me that beef is probably not the healthiest drink. No, it's not. <laughs> but it was, it was as a boy growing up. I love beef. 10 cents. You got your beef. You got your beef at lunchtime for 10 cents or milk. I, yeah. I, I, I think I used to tell my mother I was getting milk, but I'd get beep if I could. Yeah. <laughs> beep, which may or may not still being sold in Nova Scotia. Every, every once in a while, you'd find it. Like, and I'd be like, the whole comfort food. I remember going in, you'd be like, oh, wow, there's beep, but it was seasonal. It was seasonal. <laughs> it was just pure sugar and yeah. artificial flavor. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, just, for some, just for some clarity, on for anybody who's watching this who's not – Canadian or doesn't have an idea of the coaching model. Um, can you just, I guess, just define it? And, and Lucy described what the NCCP is and what it means to be, to be a master coach. In the well, it's the National Coaching Certification Program. And it was developed back in the late 70s by some pretty foundational coaches. Jack Donahue was one. Andy Higgins out of a U of T track were two of the main people. And there were a few others. That, and uh, uh, track and field guy I can see him, a British guy announcer but anyways they start this national coaching certification program and, and it started off with there was a theory component and then there was sports specific and it really took off in Canada and Canada became world renowned for it and we sold to other countries our model of coach education and again I don't think it was the reason you have high level coaching but it definitely gave you a theoretical foundation of what you need to know and, and it sparked you to learn more. Um, I became what was called the master course conductor for uh, Nova Scotia for basketball. And I actually worked most of the Maritimes where the master course conductor, you could teach up to the back that time was called the level three. And you also taught the few, the other course conductors. And then the reason I got the job with Canada basketball, because they came out in the late nineties with this whole change, they were going to make it competency-based. So in the old levels, you used to get a theory component, a technical component, and a practical. But then they wanted to switch it to a competency-based. So you were had, if you could show competency, and it was much more integrated. So I was hired by Canada Basketball to develop the whole competency-based um, NCCP. And that started in 2004. And we were up to the train to compete now up and at the same time as the long-term athlete development model came out and then was the connecting the both of them together. And that was between 2004, 2010 is when I did all that with the coaching education. Right. And then they changed over to course from course conductors to facilitators. So we now have it's uh, the NCCP still is in place, um, but it's just changed to more competency based. Yeah. And, and you know, there's there's quite a few quite a few intricacies to being a part of of NCCP and getting the training that that we're able to get here that I find really interesting. The first is that when I talk about being in, in that in that train to compete stream and, and it it's a lot of work. Like it's it, oh, yeah. and, and very very intentionally so. Like anytime yeah. somebody's just start at the beginning of that of that train to compete mm -hmm. and they're talking about how much work it is, I'm I'm never shy about saying like yeah I as somebody who's who's going to have that i want everybody else to have to work too That's like right. you want you need to earn it and then when i i work uh, I, and with our company we work with a lot of different sports and sports that are not as lucky as we are in basketball 
and, and they don't even, I think sometimes as basketball coaches, we don't always appreciate how lucky we are to have what we have on the certification, mm -hmm. the training side. But the, some of these other sports where they might have a, a much smaller coach education package that's sports specific yeah. or none at all. And they, they look at it like, wow, that's, that's incredible that you have all that available to you. Not to mention when you talk to, I talk to friends and, and colleagues in, in, in the U S or, or overseas and, and they still can't believe the, the depth and the breadth that our, that our certifications in basketball cover. Well, there's some differences in, in like I've, I've studied some of the European stuff quite co closely and the European, I've actually gone over and, and we've worked with France and I've worked with Luxembourg and I can't remember the other one, but Sweden. Uh, the main ones I've worked with, but they still rely much on what I'm going to call the old paradigm of there's a lecturer. They tell you everything they know about basketball, and then there's an exam. And, you know, like I remember with working with them in Luxembourg, and they were having like a 5% pass rate. And they could say how stupid their coaches were. And I said, maybe it's the way you're delivering the material. <laughs> you know, have you ever thought about that? Well, they were, yeah. they were just shocked that, that it was – so they let me do more of, of presentation of what we call facilitations instead of lectures. Well, the coaches were blown away. Like they just, and then, and then the guy that was doing the course, and he just said, could you do the rest of the course? Because he had never seen that kind of instruction. Yeah. You know, you know, and you know what facilitations is. It's more drawing. From, I would say instead of putting information in the cup, it's drawing from what's already in the cup. Right. right. And uh, so that's what I, I love about the NCCP. It's, it's, it's student directed or, you know, it's not like a me telling you stuff. It's, it's you actually start to apply some of these theories. Yeah. And so when I talk to coaches in the States too, they, they think, well, isn't it just a coaching clinic? I go, no, when you do an NCCP, you actually have to start to demonstrate that you can actually do these skills. Yeah. Right. And that's what it's all about. It's to start you on that process. Um, it's, and yeah, it's a lot of work, but that was one of the problems we've always run into is what a lot of coaches in Canada, they want to play that volunteer professional line. In other words, when, it's, when it requires them to do a lot of work, they want to throw out, well, I'm just a volunteer, right? And then when they want to get respect or they want to get some benefits, I say, yeah, but I, I put a lot into my coaching and they want to be the professional. And I say, you can't play it both ways. If, if you want to be known as a, a professional coach, and I've always considered myself a professional as a phys ed teacher, People would say, well, you're not a professional coach. You're a teacher. I said, every day I went to work, I was coaching people. Yeah, there was in a phys ed class, but that's, that's, that was a huge piece of coaching. And I was yeah. coaching people who didn't want to take the sport. You learn a whole lot more about how to teach them and motivate by teaching people who don't really want to be there sometimes than the ones who always want to be there. Yeah. You know, so so you're, you know, you're constantly refining how, the how to coach, not what you coach. And that's, I think, has been my strength over the years. It's the how to, not the what. Yeah. And you bring up an interesting point that is, and I've, I've told people this before, where when they ask me about, about aspects of the NCCP and whether or not they should do it or, or if it's quote unquote worth it, I often have said that I, I know it's worth it because I've had to redo stuff. Like I've, I've been yeah. told, no, that wasn't good enough. And, mm -hmm. and we can all take stuff especially now online in a variety of things where you can go through it and participate and get something for it. But, and actually it, I'll never, you probably don't remember this cause you run so many more, but you ran one of my early, early courses back in Toronto when I still lived in Ontario. And, and uh, it was the first time in a course that I had to get up and get on the court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I'll never forget the people. And, and I was, at, especially at that time, I was often the youngest person, in, in the room, but the, the moaning and groaning from the people that they had taken 15, 20 courses before in their career. And, and this was the first time that they had to stand up too. this yeah. was probably like my first or second time taking a course. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was like, yeah, you, you have to, you have to at least show me that you understand it. You don't need to be the best basketball player or anything like that. When we, no, when, right. we when we talk about demonstration, but, but the, that facilitation of like, okay, well get up here and now show me how you would teach that skill. I think it was the skills component maybe. Yes. And, um, 
and it was just like there's there was people that I honestly thought they weren't going to come back. At, like the next water break, I was like, I I don't think yeah. that person's going to come back. Yeah. But but it's different. Oh, I've had I've had many many people, you know, but there's been very very few. I can probably count on one finger the number of people when it's all said and done that I didn't learn something from this because you really made me think about my coaching. Yeah. Right. And that, yeah, it was not easy, but that's, that's what you try to put our athletes through. And I would tell people, look, if it was always easy, do you think your athletes would get better? Well, it's the same as coaching education. You know, you're going to have to be challenged to see and put yourself out of your comfort zone. That's the only way I know how to expose you to some things. You know, just telling you stuff doesn't change you. Facts don't change people. Yeah. It's usually has to be some kind of emotional or something that sparks something to make them want to change. That, that is, so that ties right in perfectly to a lot of the stuff that we teach with this company, which is that passion is the foundation of learning Yes, and not necessarily, not passion necessarily for the subject matter, but passion to learn. Yes. And that, that statement of facts change people, I think falls right in line with that. Yeah. And, and the other one I'd say is that You've facts don't connect. change people sorry facts don't change people you've got to connect i mean if facts change people then i would be i would be losing weight so easily right i'd have my heart rate <laughs> under control i'd have like we would all have that solved because there, there's yeah. a fact like it would yeah. everybody yeah. would solve all those problems it wouldn't be any but the facts don't change you yeah right and and the other one is the uh, I, I try to connect with people and yes you probably can tell i'm a storyteller because I think stories and analogies uh, create emotion. They yeah. create a connection. And, you know, more and more I look into the research around how we learn, like there, there's a difference between explicit and implicit learning. Well, implicit learning is implying, or you're just telling, telling them something, or sorry, impl Im implied. That's a story or analogy or give them an external cue, whereas an explicit as you explain, you just tell them. Well, the more I can create an analogy and it's through a good story or a good example, the more that's going to stick with you in the storm when you really need it. But if I tell you all the details of how to do a shot, like I tell you, put your hand here, build near elbow, and you have to think about that in the storm, you're not going to, you're not going to, but a quick story, you can always remember it and relates to you. And I learned that from my father too. No bigger storyteller than my father. Yeah. And that's, that's that's really true when we think about how we learn even in even in school like when we're school age kids mm -hmm. i i can go back through and consistently place the people that i learn the best from because we all have we all have people and i don't think it means that they're great or or not so great teachers but it's just the people that i learned great from or yeah. not so great from and for me consistently the people who connected with me on the highest level were the ones who I learned most effectively from and mm -hmm. the people that I connect with the most were the ones that kept me engaged through the relationship, through the stories, through the, through the broader concept than just one plus one equals two. Oh yeah. They, I can still remember my uh, grade 10 history teacher, um, my writing my first paper for him and basically he just filled it with red marks, all my spelling mistakes and, grammatical errors because I grew up when it was creative writing was what you were supposed to do. But he w he was the first teacher who said, no, this is not acceptable. You're smart. You need to spell better. You need to have better grammar. And he would put on like, you know, I'll give you a hundred, but I'm only going to give you 70 on this paper. You know, like, yeah. and I'm like, what? <laughs> That's not, and he's no, you can do better than that. Yeah. And he, and most people hated him as a teacher. I had so much respect for him because he was one who said, no, you're better than this. And I know you can do it, and I'm not going to let you get away with just slop. Yeah. Right? And it was those kind of those were the kind of teachers who who they challenged you, but they did it because they they knew you could do better. And the same with your coaches, who just wouldn't accept. No, you're better than that. Yeah. Whereas the ones who just let you get away with what you're doing, yeah. yeah, they were good people, but they didn't challenge me to be my best. And I, I've always searched out for those kind of people who would challenge you, but by connecting with you, as you just said. Yeah, and. The first time I really thought about, especially coaching as a craft that way, was actually from a fictional coach, Coach Carter. Mm -hmm. When when it, when you watch how he he when he first gets the job in that movie and he starts telling him all the stories about his sister and the girlfriend he had and he relates that back to a certain place and that kind of thing. 
I, it's, it's a little, I guess, uh, cheesy, but it, the, the, I always think about that. Like these, these were people that didn't want to listen. Yeah. Why did they listen? Cause he started connecting it with something that was deeper sure. than just black and white. I mean, that's, that was what I was about. I mean, you coach, I coached like 60 boys in football and they were all different, different racially, different economically, different how they like that was, and you had to try to connect with them. And a lot of it was through just relate stories. And they love to hear, you know, you tell a story about a former player and this player was just like this and, and they would just love those stories. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but that's how you connect it with them to get them to pay attention. As you said. Yeah. And, and speaking of connection, I'm really interested because, because you work with such a range as we, as we talked about before of, of coaches and athletes um, and, and, I think I think that we're probably we're probably a little bit biased, but I I do believe that that in terms of coach education with Canada basketball, like we we have some of the best stuff going on in the world right now, in our sport, and and across sport in in terms of how we educate our our coaches as somebody who's experiencing it and in it right now. And you you are on the cutting edge of that. Like you are you you're literally we were, we were saying before we got on the call, you're literally developing yeah. that stuff as we speak. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions just because I'm curious, because I, I think I, I, it's fair to refer to you as a, as a top coach in our nation, if, we, if, we, if not even beyond the nation. And, and in that role, how, how important is it to you to be liked? Uh, I'm not concerned about like being liked. Yeah. I think if you, if you try to go like, you'll, you cut corners. So like it's never, I never want my players to like me. I remember my first year coach in high school, the player said, coach, if you'll let us play music and practice, we'd really like you. Okay, so we played music. But then I realized they weren't really paying attention to what, I, so I didn't care. They liked me. Yeah. Did they respect me? Did they trust me? Um, I think like is a word that I would try to use. I, I hope people respect me. I know there's people who, uh, as I will say, if, if you want to put a knife in my back, stab me in the back well you're gonna to have to pull another one out because there's a lot of them in there now you can't worry about that stuff when you're dealing in high performance and you're dealing in competitive sport there are always going to be people who don't like you and for a number of reasons um but I th i'm hoping that no one's going to say well mike cheated to get to where he is mike you know uh, mistreated people to get where he is yeah there's some tough decisions when you have to you know, the toughest thing I have to do as a, as a coach right now, I'm in, and coaching coaches is where you have to tell somebody, no, you're just not good enough to make this national team. Yeah. Right. Or tell a coach, there's somebody who's just better than you right now. I know you've worked hard. I know you've done all, but you know what? Right now there's just two people that are better than you and they're going to be the coaches of this national team. That is tough. And it, people have been working for 20 years to try to become a national team coach or players have put in a lot of time and, you just, and you've never been cut. I mean, I'm cutting players who've never been cut in their life because now they're trying to for a national team. So you can't worry about like, if it was like, I'd never be able to do that. Yeah. Never be able to do that job because it'd be, but I hope when I do it, I will say it's, you know, it's um, with caring and candor, right? It's like, you have to show that the, you know, it's a truth over harmony is what I call it. I, I, I hope people will say like, Mike's pretty direct. He'll tell you. But I hope I do it with, like I say, truth over harmony, but with caring and candor. I'm not going to try to soften it. I'm not going to try to talk around it, which I think a lot of coaches do because they're afraid they'll hurt someone's feelings. I've learned that I have to be able to tell you directly, no, you have not made this team, and here's the reasons why. Right. But I'm going to sit there and listen to you and, and be empathetic to you and help you in any way I can and not just mail you a letter or put up a – uh, a, a posting or a, behind a door that I know I never to talk to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I asked the question for, just for some context, just because I know, especially as, as a young coach and, and i I know people age and experience, I don't think necessarily has anything to do with it at all. I think there's, there's a lot of coaches out there, a lot of teachers out there, a lot of leaders out there who at the end of the day, that's, that is something that, that guides decision making more often than it should. Yeah. I also know that what I've learned is that I'm a much better coach, teacher, leader when that is not even on my radar. 
and and yeah. and it it's gotten to a point where I think I, 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 it's, it's so far out there now. It still comes back. I think we're all human. Oh, yeah. so, sure. so it pops in and out. But I was talking to um, Justin Sua, who's the mental performance coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. And we had a good conversation about when you, when you talk about, I guess really that it's, it's a, kind of like that hug them and hold them concept and, and all those kind of things that, that who's that is that that's Popovich I think yeah. is hug him and hold him and and uh he he said to me Justin said to me that you need to build a relationship so strong that they can bear the weight of truth and yeah. I thought I thought that that was I've I've obviously heard hug him and hold them and and the various um versions of that but that concept of build a relationship so strong right. that they can bear the weight of truth was something that really spoke to me well, I think it's the connecting you make. Like I try to connect with all the coaches that I work with or all the athletes. And one of the most important things is to listen to them. Like ask questions and actually listen to them and don't try to solve all their problems right away. Just listen and get to know them and then connect with them. So at the start of a practice, go over and, hey, how's it going? How's your mom doing? Like just yeah. connecting uh, and showing that you care. And I got that from my mother and father, right? That's like care for people. Right. Uh, but so then that, I think that builds that trust. So then when you have to make those tough, honest decisions, I can look them in the eye and tell them, look, from what I see and what I hear, this is what is happening. And I can feel for you. I understand, but this is the decision. And is that the way that you approach having to have tough conversations, whether it's with a colleague uh, a, a player, um, maybe maybe a quote unquote superior. I don't even I don't even know if you technically have superiors. I feel like in, oh, my, yes. in my mind. Oh yes, but. oh yeah. But it's it's being able to. I think the big lesson I learned a long time ago was Ken was, I can say what I see, and what I hear, and this is how it makes me feel. What I have to avoid is saying I think you, and fill in the blanks. Right. Ken, I think you don't like me. Ken, I think you don't, uh, you're not very smart. Ken, I don't think you know how to coach. Like, yeah. But I can say, Ken, I saw this and I heard this. And, just, and then I can stop my conversation. Yeah. And now it becomes down. That something was actually saw, I saw and, and, and I heard it. Now you, it puts you where you have to, right? or I can say it makes me feel. Yeah. But when I start trying to, I think you, I don't know what you're thinking. And when you try to do that, that there's nothing that will turn somebody off more than when you try to try to, you faith, you know, think what they think. No, yeah. I can be empathetic to you. So I'm very good at observing and making note of exactly what I observed. And I learned that as a teacher, right? You just say, well, this is what I saw you saw happen. I saw the pencil being thrown across the room and it came from that desk. Yeah. Facts, not fiction. Right? That's a fact. Is that yeah. a fact that there, there's a pencil over on the floor now and it came from over there? Is that yeah. the fact? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think especially for young athletes, it's very challenging to process in terms of fact and not the stories that they're telling themselves. Oh, yeah. And that's, and that's why, if, if, you know, like, and you learn this as a teacher too, is if I would tell you something and then you go home and tell your parent, it's like the old telephone tag, you know, whisper in an ear and pass it around the room. Well, the, te the parents now come coming in on parent teaching night are phoning me up and tell me all the bad things I'm doing to their son or daughter. So I remember when I went back to teaching and there were cell phones, I remember going to a student one time who was kept using his cell phone when he spoke and said, dial your mother right now. <laughs> you know, I could dial your mother right now. We dialed his mother because I had had the conversation with his mother and the mother was trying to say, well, no, my Johnny would never do this. And the, dialed his mother and I said, okay, Johnny's going to tell you what just happened. And he had to now tell her exactly what happened. And I said, did you hear what he just said? Does that not what I told you before? Okay, now what are we going to do about it? Am I going to be allowed to take his phone from him or are you going to keep it from him at home or what are we going to do? This is now you and me working together on the same problem instead of you know but that's that was just this is the facts this is now we could deal on deal on the solution but when we're still going as you said stories in someone's head oh my goodness you never get to the you never get to fixing it yeah 
Yeah, and, and I, th I think that that's one of the things that even, even students at the university level sometimes spending a lot of time instilling in them that it's me and them against the, the proverbial hill of attaining the knowledge. It's not, it's not me trying to stop them from getting up that hill. It's not no. me trying to make it so difficult for them to get up that hill that they can't achieve the goal. It's actually us, us together against the common problem of trying to attain as much of the knowledge well, of the course as possible. It's, you know, like it, I taught a course one time that was what they call it a more of a complex bit of contract where if you did this much work, you got a B. If you did this much work, you got an A. If you did this much work, you got a C. Well, you know, a lot of them would say they all wanted an A, but then they wouldn't do the work. And then they're at the end of the year trying to claim that they really had done it. And, and it's like, oh, we're working together. I'm not, I'm, I'm just the one who's holding you accountable to what you said you're going to do. Yeah. And, and here's what I see. Boom, boom, boom. Does that yeah. make an A? No, you didn't do this. You didn't do this. You didn't do this. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't have time and I really wanted, I need the A because I'm, I, I, I get all that, but that's not going to get you the A. The work will get you the A. I never had any problems with those kind of conversations because yeah. that was my father. Like if, if something had to be done, you did it the right way. If you didn't, you go back and do it again. Right. You know, do it till you get it right. Right. Well, I, I, just as we wrap up here, first of all, I'm sure that I'm sure that there's going to be a, at least a couple of people that I know who are going to tune in to watch the director of high performance. Tell me I'm not very smart and I don't know how to coach. Cause that's, <laughs> that's going to get, that's going to get us a couple yeah. of views for sure. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that'll be, that'll be cut and auto-tuned for me Good. within 24 hours of this being released. That'll get the um, people going. <laughs> but, uh, if, if anybody wanted to follow you, where would they go to connect with you or follow you? Uh, Twitter's, uh, McKay, M J Michael. Okay. That's probably, um, that's the only social media thing that I, I can't figure out the other ones. I don't have time for Instagram, Snapchat, all those other ones. Yeah. TikTok, I don't know. <laughs> Twitter is pretty straightforward. I can do Twitter. I know how to do it. Um, again, I can't, I don't share everything because part of my job is developing stuff that's for our women's high performance program yep. and for Canadian coaches. But on game plan, if, you, if you're an NCCP coach in Canada and go on game plan, well, there's a lot of... Um, the stuff is in there and of course the nccp is a lot of that that's a lot of the work in the and my colleagues that we put together and right now we're working on redoing the whole curriculum for the nccp and i think it's it's really exciting the stuff that we're, we're now doing i think it's we learn from from get from you know, it's been about 10 years now of using this dynamic one-on-one -on -one and how we're teaching and, and i think we really got some good stuff coming down the pipe in the nccp so, yeah. but there's a lot like basketball, uh, Manitoba's website. They share a lot of it. Cause I go out there every second, every second, second year, they have me out there to do their big clinic. Yeah. I know. And I've done many a clinic in Alberta, especially in the Edmonton area with us. That's where we train out of, but yeah, there's little clinics, but I don't have any clinics or a website or anything. I just don't have time for that. I keep saying one of these days I'll write my book and, but I, I, I think I've, I used to do daily blogs back in the day when I was coach education, but um, there's lots of stuff out there, but I'm just open up for Twitter. If they want to direct message me or send me a, a, I'm always available to do calls and talk with people. So anything I can do to ever help. Yeah, cool. And, and uh, as somebody who, who borrows a lot of the stuff that you put on Twitter, that Twitter account has a, has a wealth of content on it. And uh, from, few years ago now probably five six years ago i think i went i went through one afternoon and i took 20 25 photos that you posted out of your notebook and i i still i still have them as a slideshow and it's just it's just a couple of your notes so any coaches that are watching this you should definitely be i'm sorry this is my my puppy is just bothering me right now so that's <laughs> that's why i keep looking down but uh anybody out there who's watching this who would like to learn a lot for free your twitter account is a is a good place to start well they're mostly around how to coach that's kind of what i do and um they're just thoughts there are a lot of my thoughts and reflections and uh, i find that what i like about it is sometimes when you share what you get back is even better and that's what i what i like sharing because you you meet some other people they'll, they'll they'll take it and put a spin onto it and you know, I've worked with a lot of coaches over the years who've taken some of my ideas, which a lot of my ideas I've stolen from others too. So, uh, and I just, and I like, 
Chris Oliver's comment now. He says, you don't steal things, you adapt or adopt. And I think that's what you do is you're adapting and constantly adapting and adopting ideas. And that's how we keep growing the game. And uh, I'm proud of, you know, our Canadian coaches and doing it, doing how well we've done with Canadian athletes and Canadian coaches. I think we can compete with the, the rest of the world because I do think our humanistic side, our caring side, our, our people oriented side and working together to solve problems is a, is a good way to do things. Totally. And, and I think, I, I also think that there's probably a lot of the, especially the women that you've worked with and with our national team, if any of them watch this, who would love for you to get a TikTok. Um, <laughs> I think I think that you probably get you probably get quite a few quite yeah. a few followers on that TikTok account. Well, I, I could do the push up one. Some of them dance moves. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I can do the twist. That would be the one I could do. That's awesome. Um, the the question I ask every guest on the show is: if you had to give one key piece of advice or one um, one one core part of learning that you would like to pass on others, what would that be? Oh, one key thing about learning. I would say is uh, <laughs> I would call it uh, Goldilocks. Too much, too little, just right. You know, try it. You got to try it. And you got to figure out what's the right amount. Because maybe you just didn't give it enough, enough, or you gave it too little. But it's keep trying to find that right amount, and that's that what you're constantly doing. You're constantly, you know, it's an idea of balance. You know homeostasis or whatever you want to call it it's it's learning to find that balance but you have to be willing to try too much or try too little and instead of just saying well this is what we always do right. you keep you keep on that you know it's constantly like the thermostat up down and you just got to keep pushing the to figure out the balance but then having that self-reflection the ability to step back and say okay was that too much or too little what is just right yeah. cool very cool very i like how you articulate that yeah. um well, well, Mike, I appreciate the conversation and, and honestly, I, I appreciate and, and, and I'm super grateful for the fact that we have coach education like this. And since we went there so much in this conversation, it's a great time to highlight yeah. that, that, we, that we're fortunate here in our country to have people like you. And, and I know there's a lot of other people that you work with who, who bring us a, a level of, of learning and on the coaching side that is beyond what many people get and, and we're very fortunate that way so i appreciate the time and i, I appreciate the resources and, and i appreciate you being so open to everybody too because if, if if you're watching this um mike will get back to you tweet the guy message the guy and he'll get back to you so sorry if you get inundated now but well it just takes time <laughs> i got lots right now awesome well thanks ken and uh i enjoy working with you and anything i can ever do in the future you let me know Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get podcasts or to this YouTube channel to hear our weekly episodes.